so yeah, so hi, my name is Javier Cala. I'm a forester at Westlands for Stewardship, and I'm presenting about, well, a fun title, Preparing for the Aftermath Forest, very dramatic, Managing Beach Regeneration in the Face of Beach Park Disease. Um, so next slide. All right, but before we get to talking about beach, I'll talk about Westwind and what we are first off. First off. Oh, there we go. So a primer on Westwind Forest Stewardship. Uh, so we're um, a sustainable forest license holder of the French Severn Forest. And what that the French Severn Forest is, is the Crown Land Forest in Perry Sound and Muskoka districts. Um, we're unique in, the, in as a sustainable forest license. There's sustainable forest license holders across Ontario uh, that manage Crown Land Forest, but we're unique in that we're a not-for-profit company. We're a community-based forest management company. Uh, so as opposed to having forest industry as shareholders, they are a member of our of our community, but also our municipality municipality representatives, um, First Nations representatives, and uh, other different key key community members. Um, as well, the French Severn Forest that is the, was the first publicly um, certified forest under the Forest Stewardship Council in Canada. That was pretty exciting. And we manage over a million hectares of forests, but of that, roughly half of it is on private land, as you can imagine, in Perry Sound and Muskoka District. And 320,000 hectares of that is what we would term as production forest. Uh, so that's land that we can sustainably manage for, for forest timber and non-timber resources, as well as, as uh, a whole host of, of other values that we manage our forest for. And Important about our forest is that we have a primarily a tolerant hardwood forest as a in, in Muskoka, and it's a major component of the prime Severn forest in general. And American beech is a tree species that is a prominent species within this tolerant hardwood forest. Uh, here's a map of our forest. The French Severn forest is, like I said, Perry Sound Muskoka districts, roughly. Georgian Bay is our western boundary, Algonquin Park our eastern boundary, the French River the far north and the Severn River the far south, that's how we got our name. And on this map is showing the areas of forest that are tolerant hardwoods colored in. So white is crown land that we manage, uh, gray is private land that we do not manage, and uh, green is crown land that is um, assigned as the, the forest type, which is tolerant hardwoods. So shade tolerant species such as sugar maple, um, American beech, basswood, ash, those types of, of species make part make up our tolerant hardwood forest. And then the orange is tolerant hardwood forest as well, but this is located on private land. Just to give a context of where this tolerant hardwood forest exists in Muskoka, specifically how much of it is on private as opposed to crown land. Next slide, please. Um, and now a primer on beach park disease, so we're all on the same page. So beach bark disease is an insect fungus complex caused by a beach scale insect and a canker fungus. And what the disease does is it causes severe death or severe cankering, deformation of the stem and eventually death of individual trees. And those trees being the host, the American beach. So to have beach bark disease, first we need the host, which is American beach. We need the vector, which is the beach scale insect. And we need the fungal pathogen, the Neonectra vaginata primarily. And with all these together, that's how we have beach bark disease, both the, the deformation of, of the stem and the eventual tree death of uh, beach trees. Here's a map showing how beach bark disease has spread across North America over time. It's an introduced species, or introduced disease, and they're introduced uh, vector and, and fungal pathogen. So we have, the original introduction to North America was in the Halifax area in the 1890s. So that's quite a while ago. And slowly over time, it's spread <laughs> westward, um, either through uh, fuel wood movement or the actual vector itself, the insect scale uh, moving itself across the forest. But as you can see, it's, it's sped up recently in the last couple decades. And we have it now in Muskoka, it was first identified in Muskoka in the Vancouver Baysville area in 2010. Um, and by 2015, West Wind organized um, a conference with, with forestry researchers and forestry 
uh, practitioners from Eastern Canada, from uh, Atlantic Canada, Quebec, and from the Northeastern United States to understand what it is we were dealing with and what were the options um, for management, for example, because it has become quite, uh, quite a, a disturbance event within the Muskoka Forest. And by now, across our, our management unit um, throughout our tolerant part of the forest. So we can go to the next slide. So how does a, first let's, let's discuss how beach park disease moves um, over time through a tree. So first we'll have our picturesque, you know, large diameter, smooth barked American beach. And we'll start to see these white wax masses along the stem of the tree. And that's the beach scale insect itself. And, and it creates this white fluffy mass around itself um, as it's on the bark. And so the scale itself doesn't cause beach bark disease, but it is the vector for the fungal pathogen. Um, so once we've had that, that, that beach scale on the, on the tree for a while, then you'll notice, you'll start to notice these cankers, these, these red um, fruiting bodies of the fungus. Um, and that's the Neonectria uh, vaginata primarily. And that's where we're going to start seeing it tree death. And the most dramatic type of tree death is we term beach snap because the structural integrity of the trees is degraded to the point where in a heavy wind, you have these large beach with large crowns and there isn't the strength in the wood itself anymore to hold its crown up. And so you'll, the tree will snap. But next slide. But the, uh, more common is that the tree will just die standing. And so the most dramatic of these will be in tolerant hardwood forests where you have a high percentage of American beech in the forest canopy. Um, and then also where there is American beech in the understory. So not every forest of tolerant hardwood in Muskoka is dominated by beech, but it is an important component in our tolerant hardwood forest. And in those areas where it is a prominent uh, species, the, the effect is quite dramatic. Like, like here on the right, um, in Rideout Township, near south of Baysville, um, we had a, a heavy beach uh, populated stand in the canopy and it, it essentially affected forestry operations because that area was intended to be harvested sustainably. Um, but not only were the trees dead, sufficiently dead that there was no um, timber value to harvest them, but it was also extremely dangerous to be in there. It also happened to be, that photo is actually a shot of a snowmobile trail that goes through the area. So we, we needed to figure out if, if it was even safe for snowmobiles to go through. And, and so that winter, the trails were, were closed that the, the trail association chose to close the trail because the, the risk of these standing dead trees was too great. So that was a very dramatic example, but beach bark disease does cause um, tree death in, in pretty much every case. But that's how beach bark disease affects the individual tree, how it affects the forest a little bit more uh, um, <clears throat> a little more abstract. And this slide is from a, a, a research paper that entomologists put out and they're very dramatic. Foresters can be pretty dramatic, but entomologists are even more so. And so they describe the beach bark disease affecting forests as three different stages. So first we have the advancing front, then the killing front, and then the aftermath forest. And in the advancing front, that's where you start to see the beach scale insect, but there isn't any significant death of beach trees yet. But we're seeing the scale insect, we're not seeing those red uh, fruiting bodies of, of the fungal pathogen. So, as far as beech trees, mature beech trees dying, it's not really um, standing out at that point. But surely thereafter, and, and in the hundred plus years that beech bark disease has been in North America, um, it's been anywhere from two to 10 years that we go from the advancing front to the killing front in which mature beech are dying. And in Muskoka, um, whether it's, it's a combination of being on the Canadian shield and the environmental conditions and the species um, composition here, we, we are seeing that transition from the advancing front to the killing front within two years. So it's a very dramatic change from, oh, we have beach bark disease too. Oh, our, all of our beach are dying. Um, and so that killing front is where you have the scale insect, very, uh, very large population of scale insect and also the fungal pathogen. And so beach mortality is, is extremely high. And once you get through the killing front, this is where we start getting into more, into more abstract, but not so abstract because we have to, as forest managers, we have to think about the, the next 10, 50, 150 years in, of our forests. Um, we're, we enter into the aftermath forest. 
And the aftermath forest is where we've lost beech as a mature tree species in our forest canopy. Um, beech continues to be on the site, but it's being re, re, uh, reinfected with the fungal pathogen and continues to die. Um, and so that insect pop, the insect, the beech scale population and the fungal pathogen population persists in the forest. It doesn't go away. It's not like there's a population collapse of the pest or, or the fungus and then we're, we're safe. No, it persists through, through time and we can expect that killing to continue. So a, a change to the next slide, um, a change to what our future forest condition is for that, for those specific types of forests. So beach bark disease can alter that future forest condition. And when we do sustainable forest management, we're not just planning to harvest today. We're also seeing the probabilities of where that forest is going and what it will look like in the, over the next 150 years. We can use computer modeling to do, the, to do that work. Um, so that future forest condition will be different in these, in these um, forest stands that, are, that began with a large percentage of beach in them. And primarily, um, the reason for it is because of the natural tendency for beech to sucker from the roots, um, as opposed to, for example, ash with emerald ash borer. When you see the ash die um, due to that um, pest, you saw a lot of suckering from the stump. Well, beech has a tendency to sucker from the roots. This happens naturally. If you um, pay attention to the forest and you're walking through, you might see a beech next to other mature beech. And you'll see a strip of beech, and then it'll be surrounded by, by sugar maple or, or ash or something. Um, and it's generally because of that root suckering that the trees continue to procreate and, and regenerate on a site through root suckering. And so beech bark disease causes this sudden, um, very dramatic death of beech trees. And so we see extensive root suckering, um, as well as new seedlings of, of beech growing up in the area. And these seedlings are not, are not immune to beech bark disease. They're, all, they're susceptible. And so we lose the overstory. We have lots of beech in the understory. Which are continue to be susceptible to the disease. Next slide, please. And because of the, um, silvic, the silvics of beech, it's a very shade tolerant species, which means that it can grow in shady conditions. It can outcompete other species in shady conditions, um, even, even sugar maple, which is also a very shade tolerant species. And when you have these thickets of, of, of beech regeneration, either um, along the root suckering or, or natural regeneration of, of beech on the site, they can continue to, to um, outcompete other species um, and really take up the growing space and, and prevent species such as sugar maple and yellow birds that might be on the site already or, or could germinate onto the site from, from being able to establish. And so that beach population persists and can intensify on the site. So, that makes sense. Um, so without beach bark disease management, there's a couple of things can happen in our tolerant hardwood forest. Um, there is the fact that you may have started with, uh, with little beach to begin with. And you may look at your woodlot and say, well, I don't really have that many beach. So beach bark disease, you might not even notice a significant difference. But in those woodlots and in those forest stands with a higher percentage of beach, there will be significant difference. Um, and we can expect in the future once we enter into that kill, that aftermath for a secondary killing fronts that prevent that beach from ever growing into the forest canopy. And this, this new infection happens at that understory level. So trees as, as small as five centimeters in diameter, beech trees as small as five centimeters in diameter can be, um, can be affected by the, the fungal pathogen. So these future aftermath forests um, in which beech were a major component will actually be structurally less diverse. Um, these beech thickets in these beech dominated tolerant hardwood forests are a significant threat to biodiversity off the site and the regeneration of desirable species. So if you're looking at a timber resource like sugar maple and yellow birch, it's gonna be very difficult to, to regenerate on that site, but also um, environmental and um, wildlife re uh, features of, on the site are also gonna be lost. So we're not gonna have large mature American beech that will be great trees for cavities, for cavity birds that woodpeckers can create habitat in. We're not gonna have these large diameter beech with these large crowns with um, secondary and primary and secondary branches that are quite large that create excellent nest habitat for, for hawks and, and other predatory birds. Um, so we lose those types of structural components uh, that are valuable uh, eco uh, ecological functions in our forests. Um, fortunately, 
um, the expectation is mass production, which mass is, is the food that, that beech produce. So the beech nuts are a major source of uh, caloric intake for wildlife in our forests. So fortunately, we're not gonna be losing mass production because beech isn't going away. But we're not gonna have these large mature trees. We're gonna have small trees like the picture on the left with, with cankers and, and deformities and, and no, large, no, no large crowns and therefore a significant reduction in the production of mass from beech. So wildlife will continue to access uh, food from beech trees, but they're not going to access the same amount. So they're going to be relying on other species that can produce mass like red oak, um, black cherry, um, which are in certain parts of the forest, especially in the scope, and not as prevalent as beech. So these are all kind of our uh, considerations of what will happen in our, in our forests, what is happening and what will continue to happen um, in the coming years. So next slide, please. So beach mark disease management uh, is something that, that is obviously a uh, consideration. And when you think of managing a disease, you might, you would first think, well, is there a biological control? Can we control either the insect pest or the, uh, the fungal pathogen? And while, and there's no, really no viable option has been identified or tested in the field for that's bio, that, that can control either component of beach bark disease. Um, as far as chemical controls for beach bark disease, there are, insecticides that can kill the insect scale, and there are fungicides that can kill the fungal pathogen. And this would work for ornamental high value beech trees. So for example, at a botanical gardens or an arboretum, um, or at a, at a somewhere <clears throat> very you know, prominent individual tree. But at a woodlot or for us at a landscape forest management setting scale, it's simply not practical, not feasible, and it would be extremely expensive as well. So that's not really an option. So what is available to us as far as beach park disease management is silviculture um, and manage and changing the way we manage our forests uh, in order to account for beach park disease and the effect it's having on our trauma and part of the forest. So that when we are managing and expecting certain probabilities as in a future forest condition, we can steer away from that aftermath forest condition and increase the probability of maintaining a healthy, diverse forest uh, that, that includes those all those values, such as timber resource, um, mass for, for animals, and ecosystem, other ecosystem functions and services. And so the two ways we do so is with stand-level harvest prescriptions to reduce and eliminate the beach component in the forest canopy. Um, so this is before the beach, beach bark disease has rendered that, that tree uh, not valuable as a timber resource, so rather than perhaps firewood. Um, and then the other component is managing the regeneration of beech in the understory uh, and promoting the desirable tree species. So uh, for example, um, black cherry and red oak to produce mast and timber, sugar maple, yellow birch to produce uh, timber and increase diversity of the forest as well. So that's at, at, the, uh, the, crown, at the crown land scale. So, and so these control, so the, the, the actual stand level forest canopy component can be easily accomplished with current forest harvesting systems, whether it be hand felling um, with a chainsaw, using a feller buncher, um, these met, the, that can all be accomplished pretty readily by just changing our expectations of what that harvest will look like. But to control beach regeneration, that is a whole other uh, ball game. And so we have to, we've had to be very creative and come up with, with interesting um, solutions to that. And so the options available that work are uh, primarily basal bark herbicide application treatment. And what that is, is taking a backpack sprayer and spraying a um, herbicide, Garlon ready to use, which has the active ingredient to triclopyr, and spraying that right at the base of, of the, the trees, the, the beach trees, and having that herbicide wrap around the stem of the tree, essentially girdling it and killing that individual. So with our stand level harvest prescription, we're cutting the mature trees with equipment and with chainsaws or, or with equipment, we, we cut down trees down to 10 centimeters in diameter, roughly 10 centimeters in diameter. And see at trees that are about thumb size up to 10 centimeters of beach, American beach, those are the ones that are tackled with this basal bark herbicide application. So that, that size class that is far too small to, to be feasible with, with uh, equipment, with, with a chainsaw or with, 
with the harvesting equipment. That's what's, what's tackled with the with with these understory treatments. So really, it's the understory that's being dealt with. And then things that are smaller than that, like seedlings, those those simply can't be can't be tackled with effectively. The other option is the hack and squirt. So when it's a little bit bigger, so it's in the 10 centimeters to maybe 20 centimeters, and it was missed in the actual harvest, we can still handle those beech trees with the hatchet hacking into the softwood, so into the sapwood and and exposing the cambium layer, uh, the, the growing cells of the tree and squirting um, the herbicide in there. So in that case, we would use Vision Max, which is a glyphosate as, as the active ingredient. Um, and so this is very, very practical in that it's, it's specific, it's very targeted, and you can kill a single beech tree that's thumb size, for example, with basil bark spray and have a sugar maple that's thumb size right next to it that isn't affected whatsoever, right? This, it wouldn't be possible to aerial spray or to have a, a large piece of equipment like a skitter blasting the herbicide, it would kill everything. So this way we're able to target handheld equipment that targets the actual species we're after. And so the applicator obviously needs to identify an American beach from other species, which is pretty easily done. And then operationally cut stump herbicide application, you can use either Garlon or Vision Max. And that's during the harvest, you would cut the tree down, spray the stump, and the idea here is to prevent or reduce that root suckering. So once the tree is killed, it naturally uh, is stressed and then regenerates through the roots. So this will reduce or eliminate that root suckering. And finally, the more the mechanical option is a brush saw treatment, cutting down the beech seedling or beech saplings, those thumb size to 10 centimeters in diameter, so the trees with brush saws. Um, and that will at, at the very least reduce their population for the existing advanced regeneration of sugar maple yellow birch, for example, to take off. So next slide, please. So those are, those are some options. Um, and we've field tested them in our forest on Crown land. We have some demonstration sites near the Baysville area where beach bark disease was the most active. And we've established a protocol with, for our, our management unit of, of which ones to use. And we, over the last five years, we've treated over 1,400 hectares of tolerant hardwood forest um, that has been harvested. So this is post-harvest. And, and primarily, this has been with that basal bark herbicide application. And where the, the, the stems were too large, we were using the hack and squirt method and um, right after. So the crew is a, a crew of four or five people, all licensed uh, herbicide applicators, walk through an area, a defined area, and they um, spray the beach uh, saplings and eliminating those, those trees and allowing the existing advanced regeneration of other desirable species to take off. So we're not planting trees. We already have a diverse understory of multiple species and we're eliminating these very shade tolerant uh, beech trees that are, would outcompete their neighbors um, and removing them to give all the other species a chance to really take off and, and utilize the growing space, both sunlight, physical space, and nutrients in the ground. Um, so all done post-harvest. And like I said, we select the site specifically for those areas. So where we have the concern that this site will regenerate to beach and that will once again be killed by beach bark disease. So in order to push that forest to more diverse, uh, healthier forest, we use apply this treatment. And the cost of this is paid through the forest in industry itself. Uh, there's no external or provincial funding. This comes with within the forest industry that works in the French Severn Forest and the, and the, the, the stumpage or, or crown dues that they, that they pay for, the, for using the wood in the French Severn. Um, part of that goes into our renewal trust fund and our forestry futures fund. And we utilize this money for this, or part of this money for this. Next, thanks. Uh, so what that looks like is, is like this. So we're not tackling like that previous photo, which, which was like an elephant graveyard. Um, we're not tackling those, those sites that are purely beach in the overstory and purely beach in the understory. Those are dramatic. Those will require complete stand conversions. With these treatments, we are taking sites that had a major a 30 to 60% uh, beach component in the overstory, which was removed through the harvest and removing the beach from the understory as well. So this, this shot shows you lots of healthy sugar maple and yellow birch, for example, and then the dead beach uh, regeneration. 
in an aerial shot of a similar type of forest where we have that opening in the canopy because it was a selection harvest. So there's there's an opening in the canopy. We remove the beech, we remove um, uh, maple as well, but kept a diverse forest of, of other species with different age classes and killed the beech in order to allow everything else to, to grow into that space. And so, on, as you can see on the left, we're not killing beach from the site, like we're not eradicating beach. Beach continues to persist on the site. It will continue to be a part of that forest. But what we are doing is giving a leg up to other species of trees on the site. And on private land, a unique opportunity, thanks to the work of the Muskoka Watershed Council, um, a pilot project was initiated by the Muskoka Watershed Advisory Group, funded by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, um, led by Westwind. And what this was is a private land beach regeneration management for us. So taking what we learned on crown land and applying it uh, at a small scale to private land forests in Muskoka. Um, so a task team was put together, key partners from the Muskoka watershed um, and area, not just Muskoka watershed group. And they, they provided input related to the project planning. So we came forward as West Wing with all this experience and practice of, of dealing with beach. Um, and then together we figured out what would be what would work best in this project. Um, and of course, with the with the volunteer of private landowners volunteering to be their properties for us to apply this work. So we couldn't have done the work without private landowners that volunteered their properties for this work to be uh, done on. So the objective of the, of the project um, for beach management on private land was to improve forest ecosystem function and services um, on private land in, in the Muskoka watershed uh, with respect to beach park disease. The, the beach regeneration method control method that was, that was chosen was the brush saw treatment. So the herbicide application treatments weren't chosen, but the brush saw treatment was. And following that up with tree planting. So choosing stock that could be mo both meet the biodiversity uh, goals um, of the group and, and, and the, the, the landowners, and then having climate change and, and climate change, climate adaptation in mind in that tree planting component. And so to select the, the sites um, on private land for the project, we looked for areas that had a heavy dominance of beach on the site in the overstory and in the other story um, that were hardwood forests and, and also high value areas as far as within the Muskoka River watershed. These being close to water features, having good access, um, but also um, of importance to, to the private landowner as well. So as opposed to the type of, of sites that we pick on crown land where it's not a foregone conclusion that beach bird disease will, will likely turn that forest into an aftermath forest. We're looking for sites that have an existing component of sugar maple and other species that we can push the forest towards because we are expecting the, the existing regeneration to, to tackle that site. For this project, we were looking for sites that were quite dramatic as far as beach bird disease impact on the site. Um, and so looking at the Muskoka watershed, river watershed, and most of it is within our forest management unit of the French Severn. And on this photo, we have beach tolerant hardwood forest on private land. Um, and most of it is in green because we highlighted the, the beach forest areas with beach in the canopy that uh, were within 300 meters of the road. So we wanted to make sure we had good access because we're doing a brush saw treatment. If you zoom in, we can start getting a little more, a little pickier. So white is crown and then gray or, or is uh, private land and colored areas in green were meant that they're close to 300 meters from a road. But now we can look at the percentage of beach in the, in the overstory. So yellow is 10% beach in the overstory. Orange is 20% beach and 30% beach or more is purple. So as you can see there, while beach is a component of our forests in Muskoka, and you'll find beach pretty much throughout Muskoka without doubt, the percentage of beach in the canopy will vary. And so that dramatic uh, condition that beach park disease will have on a forest visually will be limited to those areas that, that, that began with a high percentage of beach in the, in the canopy. And so we tried to tackle those areas with, very, with a high percentage of beach to 
because we're looking to do manual work and then tree planting on the sites where we don't expect existing advanced regeneration of other species. Next, please. Um, so we picked seven sites across the Muskoka River watershed from Moon River to uh, Limber Lost Forest in the Far East, and then Bird Lake was a key one down by Brace Ridge because that's where uh, beach bird disease has been around in Muskoka the longest. Next slide, please. And so we, from there, we, we, we get the property owners involved. And here, for example, is a parcel of land that's, that's owned by a property owner. And, and there's tolerant hardwoods uh, throughout it. However, how much of that is sufficient beach in the overstory and sufficient beach in the understory for this project to be viable and practical or useful um, has to be determined by walking. So lots of walking in the bush to delineate those boundaries. So next slide, please. And what we're left with is, in that case, a 15.8 hectare polygon uh, to work with to send our brush stock through and then follow up with tree planting. So 10 treatment sites in total across seven sites. Um, and for most of these sites, timber harvest was either completed or planned for. Um, and that's important because the timber harvest, thinking about tree planting on the site, we still need openings in the canopy. We're going to be putting seedlings in the ground to one to four year old seedlings. And so they need they need space, they need light to, to, re to reach the forest floor. So having a timber harvest or a disturbance of some sort opens up the canopy uh, beyond just the death of beach is important. Um, the treatment areas vary in size from areas as small as two hectares in size to 16 hectares in size, and a total of 75 hectares were treated with the brush saw treatment. This was done this past summer, and we plan on tree planting in the spring of 2023. Those are some photos of the brush saw crew. Uh, Brinkman and Associates was the crew that we went with. And as you can see, they've got their georeference maps of their site on their phones and their tablets. Um, very conscientious of, uh, of the environment. You can see them fueling their brush saws with a spill kit uh, mat already. So very conscientious. And also PPE, very important. Um, and nowadays, they even have still has this exoskeleton harness so that it'll take most of the weight of that brush saw because this is a very physical demanding work. Um, next slide, please. And the forest condition prior to the work being done, you can see some beach already dead. Uh, the photo on the left, the beach, is, the beach is already affected by beach bark disease and dying. So there's already openings in the canopy. Um, and a lot of the, the greenery and canopy around that tree is also beach. So we expect that opening to grow and to create space and canopy for those seedlings. Um, but also the understory needs, understory needs to be tackled as well. And that's where, thank you, next one, please. Uh, that's where the crew comes in. So a dense understory of beach tackled by our brush saw crews. Um, and working effectively, they, they fell those, those uh, saplings into, a, into one face. Um, so not only is it more productive and effective for them, it's also safer to have everything falling in one direction. Like we would in an old school clear cut have all the trees fall in one direction, so they do so the same with that, with the, the, the regeneration. Um, and as you can see at the photo on the right, uh, they can tackle some pretty large stems. So that's probably a 15 centimeter beach that was essentially felled with, uh, with a brush saw. Uh, so limited in how high or low you cut, it's just the ergonomics of a folding the machine, but you can fell it and bucket even and have large stems dropped on the ground. And on the left is an example of, of an area that had been harvested and there was a lot of beach in the understory. So not as much beach remaining in the overstory, but a dense understory of beach. So by removing that understory of beach, it does create significant planting opportunities. Um, some more photos of what, that, of what those openings look like um, as far as the work completed and, and some, some sites for planting trees. And then finally, bringing the landowners on site to, to see the, the situation and, and aware that they have beach on the site and not and coming to appreciate the, the, the extent of, of damage that beach disease has had on the site. So those trees have clearly all that white on the, on the beach is scale insect and, and the rust is on those as well. So big openings already. And then with those trees dying, it'll create an even greater open. So lots of opportunities to plant trees. And really, there's some hobble bush on the ground. In this particular site, there's some some seedling um, some seedlings of sugar maple, but not much of an understory other than that beach. So planting on the site next year, we've ordered seedlings, 33,000 tree seedlings to plant across the site. 
hunting density still to be determined because um, it really depends on the microsite availability per site. So there's going to be lots of flexibility there, but a diversity of species, both uh, conifer and deciduous, some mass producing species such as red oak and black cherry, um, and some diversity so, such as red spruce and uh, yellow birch um, to really create a more diverse uh, understory in a forest. So we expect some challenges from using the brush saw tending treatment. We, we have demonstration sites that we established on crown lands that led us away from using brush saw uh, on crown when working at larger scales where we treat around 300 hectares a year, for example. Um, so we can expect vigorous stump sprouting from the cut uh, seedling or seedlings because we haven't killed the roots, the tree's still alive. So it will uh, sucker from that, from that stump. Root sprouting is ubiquitous with beech. So we can expect that from this, the trees that we cut and also the dying, the dying beech as well. Um, and because there's no scarification, it's a very low impact work having people walk through and cut with brush saws. So there's no uh, disturbance of the forest floor. That leaf litter layer is still there. Three mineral soil exposed, and show so it will impact the microsites both for planting and also for um, any actual regeneration of other species. Um, and also, these seedlings that we plant will be competing with what's already on site, primarily beech, which is very shade tolerant. So, future uh, beach regeneration management considerations for this private land project is we might have to consider further brush saw tending um, to remove competition from the seedlings immediately around the seedlings themselves. So, and then we may also look at basal bark herbicide tending uh, for the same reason to remove the competition around those, those seedlings and promote their, their growth. So yeah, that's my presentation.